My name is Mike, and if we haven't met, I'd love to meet you after service. I encourage you to come up front, shake my hand, say hi, I'll answer any questions that you have, whatever it may be. But we've got a lot of stuff to go over today. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get in, and we're just going to let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit's going to do today, all right? So Father God, I just come to you right now, and I give you all the glory, I give you all the praise, because you're truly worthy of it all, Father. And I thank you for everything that you're doing and on this day, this man-made day, this Father's Day, it can bring up so many different emotions from happiness to this sadness to this bitterness, anger, resentment. All these things can come up, Father. But what I pray is that from the moment that each and every one of us walked in here, that we felt your presence, that we felt your love, that your arms were wrapped around us. And I pray that each and every one of us can understand that we're truly loved by you, accepted by you, Father. I pray that we would have this understanding that you love us so much that you're not going to leave us the way that we are, but you're going to change and transform each and every one of us. So, Father, I pray today that your words are heard. Remove me from every aspect of it. Have your will and have your way. Take the veil off from our faces. Open our hearts. Give us ears to hear, Father, what it is that you have for us. And Father, truly change and transform us from the inside out. We love you. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to be in the book of Titus today. So just open up your book and just stay there. Normally I go all over the place in Scripture, but we're just going to stay in Titus today. I'm going to do a little bit of some other Scripture that I'll throw in there, but just stay in Titus and you'll be all right. They asked for the notes and I said, just put in Titus. Right? Just, that's all we need is to go through there. And you might be asking, well, why in the world did you choose Titus for Father's Day? I didn't choose it. The Holy Spirit chose it. And he chose it months ago when he put this on to me. Because you see, this, this book isn't written to men. It isn't even written to a church. It's written to a young pastor named Titus. And it's written to him in a way to where it teaches him, shows him, instructs him on how to get this church back in order. It shows him what he needs to teach, the people that he's looking for. And it, it does it in these 46 verses, and it's laid out in such a way that the overall message of this book is so beautiful. It's that God saved you so that you will partner with the local church in spreading and living out the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the important part is that God saved you not you. This book talks about good deeds more times than any other book. You'll hear good deeds in this book. Six times, but it's all because God saved you for those good deeds. God saved you to be able to cultivate and to keep what he's given you. And it's laid out in a way where Titus 1 is about the church. How to do that in the church. Titus 2 is about the home. And Titus 3 is about the community. And it's laid out in this beautiful way. So we'll look at Titus the man. We'll look at Titus the book. We'll look at what it means to cultivate and keep today. We're going to go over all that. So that's a lot. We might be here for hours today, if that's all right. All right? So this is a book of action. That's what this book is. It's of action. It's about living out the gospel of Jesus. You ready to dig in? All right, we got a lot to do. So let's cover some scripture here. Titus 1. Paul, let's just stop there. It's going to be a while if we go word by word. But honestly, let's listen to this for a second. There may be some of you in here right now that are saying, I am not worthy of this love that you talk about. I'm not worthy of this. You don't know what I've done in my life. You don't know the things that I've done. You don't know what's happened to me. I just, I got to do all this stuff before I can ever think about God loving me tell you a story. This guy used to be called Saul. This guy has a backstory and a history of killing Christians, of putting them into prison. This guy has a story that's beyond probably any story that you have of his past and what his identity could be rooted in. This guy, if any of us would say, he's not worthy to do this, but God does a work in him. Paul didn't do anything. 
Paul was radically changed and transformed in an instant. And he went on to write over half the New Testament. I mean, this is a guy that even when he went to the disciples, they were like, uh, nope. It took Barnabas to speak to them about it, to say, no, he's, he's legit. Right? This is that guy where we're sitting here going, ah, I'm not worthy. He's worthy. But what's important is, I told you, he killed and imprisoned and has a past. But that's not how he starts this book. That's not what he says that he is. He says, Paul, a bond servant of God. Not Paul, former Christian killer. Not Paul, I used to put people into prison. Paul, a bond servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Let's stop there for another time. That's his identity and his assignment. Right in one sentence. And it wasn't rooted in the back. And it wasn't rooted in anything that he had did before. It was rooted into who he is now. He knew he was a son. He knew he was accepted. He knew that he was loved. And he was changed and transformed and was given this new name of Paul. He wasn't his past anymore. This is his identity. And then he says his assignment, the apostle. Each one of us has an assignment. Each one of us has that, whether you're a dad in here, whether you're a husband in here, whether you have leadership in a workplace, wherever it may be, that God's entrusted people, your neighborhood, you have an assignment, but it's so important. Your identity needs to be first, and then your assignment after that. Your identity never changes, ever. Your assignment can change. It can be changed from one moment to another, from one season to another. That assignment can change. Different workplaces, whatever it may be, ministry, different ministries called, whatever it is, it can change. Your identity never will. And what happens is, men, even women, we find our identity in our assignment. We find our identity rooted in whatever assignment that is, whether it be I'm a husband, I, I'm a father, I'm a leader, I'm in this ministry, I'm in that aspect. You find your identity in that assignment, and when that assignment changes, you're lost. Your mind goes haywire because you have no idea who you are anymore because everything's changed. But when you find your identity in Christ, it doesn't matter. See, what happens, guys, is when we put our identity into our assignments, we get in this vicious cycle where we start thinking one assignment's better than the other. Well, you've got a better assignment. I'm starting to compare between, well, God gave you this and not me. Yours is better. And you start to want that. And then you start to, to compete for that and not understanding and not noticing that, hey, there's many hands, one body. Right? We're each called to a different assignment, and not one is better than the other. That's the problem where we get in our earthly mindset, and what the enemy tries to do is to get that mindset behind us that, hey, this person's got a better assignment than me. It's not that way. Each assignment is perfect. Men, your assignment, your responsibility as being a husband, your wife. There's no other person's responsibility but yours. Same with your kids, your workplace, wherever you're at. Let me give you an example of this. Genesis 2. In verse 7, he says that he creates man here. Right? It says, The Lord God formed the man from dust from the ground, breathed into his nostrils. The man became a living person. So he creates man here, but what's so important is he has to put man somewhere. He's got to give the man something to do. Who knows an idle man is dangerous? right? An idle man is dangerous. Guys, if you're sitting around not doing nothing, if you're idle, get plugged in. Start doing something. An idle man is dangerous. So God forms the garden. He creates the garden. And then in 15, it says, then the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and to tend it, which is what I called this message. Titus, cultivate and to keep, cultivate and to tend. 
Then it says, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, from any tree of the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For on the day that you eat from it, you will certainly die. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I'll make him a helper suitable for him. God told Adam, before Eve was even created, to cultivate and to keep. We try to focus on all the things that are distorted and what men are doing wrong and what society is doing wrong. Let's get back to what he created it to be. Let's get back to the beginning of what it was created as to cultivate and to keep, he was told. And Eve was there, was to cultivate and to keep. I'm from a town of like 800, it's not even a town, it's a village of 800 people. It's so tiny, right? We have cornfields and bean fields all around us in Illinois, right? So when I think of cultivate, I literally think of bebopping along in a tractor, listening to music, listening to, have my AC on when it's hot, with a big old plow behind me and a bunch of horsepower tractor plowing through the ground. So when I hear cultivate, I'm like, oh, that's pretty easy work. That's a fun day in the field watching deer run by. That's not what this is. This cultivate and keep is blood, sweat, and tears of plowing through a field physically. Let's forget about an animal behind there. Let's just grab a one single plow and start pushing it through the field. It's hard work. It's blood, sweat, and tears to dig up the soil, to move it out of the way, to get all the old junk gone, to bring the fresh soil up, to be able to plant the seed in there so fruit, as Pastor Adam talked about, would be able to flourish then. It's, it's a cultivate and a keep a blood, sweat, and tears of yourself sacrificially for the good of others so that your wife will flourish, so she will be the woman that she's called to be. Not in a domineering way, you're sacrificing your blood, sweat, and tears for the betterment of them, for your kids. That's what this cultivate and keep. That's the mindset that we got to get back to. And the keep is the protection aspect. Adam didn't do a good job of protecting her. He sat by and watched, right? He was a sluggard, right? Lazy at home. He was there when Eve took of the apple. He was instructed to cultivate and to keep, to protect. That's what we got to get back to. Amen? All right, so there's that little intro part, 15 minutes in. All right, let's keep going. Let's skip down to verse 4. So he writes this message, right? Paul does, this bond servant of God, knowing who his identity is, knowing what he's called to do, knowing that he needs to spread the gospel and, and then raise up leaders, Timothy, Titus being one. He says, to Titus, my true son in the common faith. So who is Titus to Paul? Who is Titus anyways, right? There's like 13 accounts of who Titus is. Titus is this faithful follower of Jesus Christ. He's this courageous servant and this friend. And we see all of this because Titus was on the trip with Paul when he went up to Jerusalem to, the, to uh, speak against what they were trying to say that circumcision was needed. And he was with them there as a Gentile that was not circumcised. And Paul's saying, look at this is a follower of Jesus Christ. These rules, these re regulations that you're putting on, they're not needed. And he's there traveling with them. He's this guy that Paul sent this letter to the Corinthians. And he sent this letter, this harsh letter, right, to teach, to, to get this church back in line, to bring them back together. That's who Titus is. And he's this friend. And we see all of this in 2 Corinthians. Well, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. But let's go to 2 Corinthians. We see it in the very, very beginning in chapter 2. This is what Paul says about Titus here. He's on a trip and he says, I had no rest for my spirit. Not finding Titus, my brother, but saying goodbye to them, I went on to Macedonia. You ever had this unrest, this uneasy about somebody you love? You don't know what's going on. You don't know where they're at. They're supposed to call. They're supposed to do this. They're supposed to be in touch with you. You're supposed to see them. That's this love that he has for him, this friendship that he has for him. He, he doesn't know where he's at, so he's got this unrest in his spirit. But then in, in chapter 7, Paul says this.
He says, For even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. But we were afflicted on every side, conflicts on the outside, fears inside. But God, who comforts the discouraged, comforted us by the arrival of Titus. So he was comforted because Titus came. And he was able to see Titus. And he knew Titus was okay. That's who Titus is right here. That's who he's writing to. But listen to this. It goes on and says, And not only by his arrival, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted among you, as he reported to us your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. He's this friend that was able to go deliver this message to this church and was able to restore them and bring them back to whole. That's who Titus is. And that's why in verse 5, it says, For this reason I left you in Crete. Crete is this tiny island south of Greece that's like 150 miles wide by like 30 miles, or 150 miles long by 30 miles wide. And we know people from there heard the gospel at Pentecost. It says it in Acts. So they brought it back and they probably set up these little churches, they set up this stuff, but you got to know where Crete's at. In the shipping lane, this is a melting pot of religions. This is chaos down there. This is paganism that's trying to work its way in trying to say the gospel's not right. This isn't that, right? So he's telling them, hey, this is why I'm leaving you here. All right, I trust you. You're a faithful servant. I know what you can do. Here, you're staying in Crete. And how much did Titus have to trust? How much did Titus have to believe? All right, I trust you. I know this is where I'm called to do. Titus had to be hearing from the Lord and he had to be trusting Paul, right? The one that he looked up to, the one that he was getting taught from, like, this is where I need to be. And Paul tells him, this is what I want you to do. I want you to set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Remember how I told you this place is all messed up. This place has got paganism, different religions, households are being messed up, doctrines are being taught wrong, all things are being done wrong, right? Titus 1 is about getting the church in order. And it's important how he laid this out. He started with the church, with everything that's messed up, with all the stuff that's going on there, the first thing he tells him to do is go and get the church in order. Why? Because that's where we're called to learn. That's where we're called to be instructed. That's where we should be seeing Christ. That's where we should be seeing godly men, godly women, living out what it means to be a Christian. Taking those God encounters and giving them back in the household, raising up the household, changing and transforming the household. I'm telling you, if we're not doing it here, if the churches aren't doing it at a whole, the world's going to do it. And the world's going to show them the worldly ways. This is what he's telling them. I need you to find these men. Men that are beyond reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of indecent behavior or rebellion. For the overseer must be beyond reproach as God's steward. Not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not overindulgent in wine, not a bully, not greedy for money, but hospital, loving what is good, self-controlled, righteous, holy disciplined, holding firmly the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict it. How often do we sit and go, man, Lord, I wish you would just spell it out. I wish you would just tell me exactly what it is that you're saying. I wish you would just tell me exactly the instructions that you want. He did it right here. And we don't pay attention to it. We make the little caveats for it. Or we don't, we're like, ah, I don't know, is this really what you're saying? I don't know. But when I read this, this isn't just for an elder. This is, this is for every man should be looking this way. Every one of us should be looking this way. And what he's saying here is, I'm looking for these people. He tells Titus to go and find these people. He doesn't tell Titus, hey, why don't you just sit back, take a break, listen for the ones that are, are wanting this. They'll tell you. They'll tell you they want to be an elder. They'll tell you they want to be the leader. They'll tell you they want to be the pastor. Just wait. They'll come to you. That's not what he's asked. That's not what he's telling them. I'd be a little afraid if someone's coming to tell me that. He's telling them to go find these people that are already living that lifestyle, that aren't looking for anything, but they're truly chasing after the Lord, and that's what they're doing. They're not looking for any recognition. They're not looking for anything. They just want to see the kingdom furthered. It's this selfless mindset instead of this selfish 
mindset. We see this in today's culture, right? We see this world revolves around me mentality. And this is the total opposite of that, right? We, this is opposite of this I-centered mentality. When you start hearing people say I or me or this is mine or this is my stuff or this is my thing or this is my ministry, if you start hearing that, that's not what it is. You can even say my kids. My kids are not my kids. The Lord entrusted them with me. They are His. It's not this I-centered mentality. Sometimes we even get this you-centered mentality where we think about, you know, we center our life around our kid. We center our life around our wife, our husband, our spouse, our workplace, our ministries. We center our life around that and that alone and nothing else. I mean, I even see a we-centered mentality. 1 Corinthians, very first chapter of 1 Corinthians. It says this, now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am with Paul, I am with Apollos, I am with Cephas, or I am with Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? It's not this we man mentality. It's not this uh, camps inside of the churches. It's not this denomination aspect, right? I, I keep thinking in my mind, we see this church of Crete aspect and elders in all these spots and we see this in the book of Revelation with the church of Ephesus and Laodicea. How great would it be if we saw the church of Clay County or the church of Duval or the church of Florida or whatever the case may be, one clap. If we saw that as opposed to a church on every corner that was trying to fight for themselves and not for the unity. And it's not unity for unity's sake. I'm not saying that we bend on all the rules, right? We stand firm on the Bible. Yes. Yes. What I'm saying is that in Jesus' prayer, in John 17, he said, Lord, I pray that they abide in me as I abide in you. And he uses the word, so that. Yes. So that the world may believe that you sent me. Yes. That's what it's about. That's what he's talking about, right? That's this unity aspect that we got to get to this mindset right so these are the people that he's looking for we got to get rid of this mindset of i you we it is christ-centered kingdom-centered and we're going for the kingdom and the kingdom alone why does paul want these people why is he looking for them this is what he wants them to do i want you to be able to both exhort and sound doctrine this is in verse 9 exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict it. He wants them to be able to teach. He wants them to be able to cultivate and to keep, cultivate and to tend that which they have been assigned or responsibility for. That's what he's calling them to do. That's what he wants. You see in Acts 8, you see Philip with an Ethiopian and this guy is reading, right? And Philip hears him reading out of Isaiah. And Philip's like, do you understand what you're saying? And he's like, I have no idea. How am I supposed to know unless someone teaches me? And he invites Philip up. And Philip, they start to read. And they're reading about the suffering servant. And the guy's like, who is this? Who is this guy? And you know what? Philip goes and shares Jesus. That's what we're called to do. We're called to teach, right? That's what we're called to do. We're called to spread and to live the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Why is this so important? Just like in Crete, we have it today in this world that we live in. It says it in verse 10. For there are many rebellious people, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of dishonest gain. He's telling them this is the reason why we got people that are spreading false gospels. We got people that are just ruining families. We got people out there that are just running amok. We need to get this in order. And he tells them we need to start with the church, get this leadership in order. Men, women, each one of us is called for this. Goes on in verse 16. They profess to know good but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable, disobedient, and worthless for any good deed. That's the same thing that you find in James. 
James says the same thing, but he talks about a tongue. And he talks about how we bless those with the same mouth and then we curse them with the same mouth. We need to be about being and not just speaking it. We need to do and not just speak it. That's what he's calling them to do. That's why he said, go find the people that are already doing it. Because it's not a change for them. They're already doing this. They're already living this lifestyle. They're already living this. They're already chasing after. That's why we've talked about the intimate pursuit so much these last few weeks. Because it's truly about that intimate pursuit with the Father. And then he goes on to chapter 2. And in chapter 2, he says this. Proclaim the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. That's all he wants them to do. Proclaim the things that are fitting for sound doctrine. Stop debating about, stop worrying about things that are of no importance. We need to be talking about sound sound doctrine. And this is what he says. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and perseverance. Now, don't what I'm about to say, I love it. I love that we do this push-up contest up here, and it's fun. Don't ever stop doing it because it's really fun to watch. I don't know how many of them are cheating up here, though. I don't know. They weren't going all the way down. But this is what society thinks men look like. Strong, courageous aspect of men, right? That's what we're thinking. He says, temperate, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love and perseverance. I want you strong in the faith. I don't care if you're strong muscular-wise. I want you strong in the faith. Now, you need to be healthy, body and soul and spirit and everything, right? We're going to get to that in a second. But that's what it's about. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Like I talked about beforehand, guys, this subject, this aspect that we try with Ephesians and say, oh, you need to submit, be worthy of being submitted to. Right? Like, it's not about that. It's about sacrificial love. It's about giving up everything for them. Just as Christ died for the church, you are to die for them. Cultivate and to keep. He says this, likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. Then he goes on and he tells Titus this, in all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity and doctrine dignified. Sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. He's teaching them. He's instructing them. This is what we need to be. Sound doctrine. This is what we need to teach. Sound doctrine to be able to teach these guys and gals what it means. So that the enemy doesn't have a hold of us. So the enemy can't come back and say anything bad about us. You might be sitting here going, man, I'm falling short. I'm falling short. I'm falling. I can't do this aspect. I fall short on cultivate and keep. I've realized, like I told you, as I have been teaching, or if I've been going through Titus and learning and digging into Titus, the more I go through this, the more I go, man, I am falling short. And he is doing a work inside of me more than anybody else. I need to learn how to cultivate and keep so much better my body. I need to cultivate and keep. I need to cultivate and keep my wife, my kids, my ministry that I'm called to, the people that I'm entrusted to. We need to cultivate and keep, but it's okay, there's hope. We can't do this on our own. It's only by Jesus. But what we can do is make a commitment and not just be vocally about it, like I have been, but truly have a commitment, each one of us, to go forward. There's two gospel messages inside of Titus. Two of probably the best gospel messages that you'll read in the, two te- in the New Testament And they're found inside of Titus. And they're found inside of these 46 verses, which is amazing. Because Titus, Paul's telling Titus, everything has to be grounded on the gospel of Jesus Christ. It can't be grounded into the good deeds that you're doing, 
men that are in here thinking you got to do something in order to earn his love. You got to do these things because we're fixers, right? And we got to try and fix everything. There's nothing you can do other than submit to him. Listen to this gospel message, one of them that he says in here. It starts in verse 11 in chapter 2. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, instructing us to deny ungodliness and world desires and to live sensibly. I was talking to Bishop beforehand about Titus, and we could teach an entire lesson on just that verse alone, those sections. It's by the grace of God that teaches you. It's his grace that comes into you. It's nothing that you do that it did it. He goes on to say, righteously and in a godly manner in the present age, looking for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed, to purify for himself a people for his own possession, eager for good deeds. These things I speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. No one is to disregard you. How many of you have heard this before? How many of you have heard we need to cultivate, we need to keep, we need to be the protector, we need to teach, we need to entrust into our kids everything that is of the gospel. We need to make sure we're founded on the gospel. We've heard this over and over before if we've been in church. If this is your first time hearing it, you're going to hear it more and more. But what Paul tells Titus is this, remind them. This is the first part of chapter 3. In chapter 3, verse 1, he says, remind them. Because we forget. We forget about it. He says this, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. Can I tell you that if you're at a place that you can't receive, that if you're hurt, if whatever the case is and you can't receive from anybody that's in leadership or you just have a hard time, why are you where you're at? You're not helping yourself out. You need to go find a place that you can receive from. Because all you're doing is let the enemy fill you up with all this bitterness, with all this stuff. Let me tell you, the enemy is going to come in at the weakest, most vulnerable time that he can get you and try to. Let me give you an example. I wasn't going to talk about this, but I got to. Holy Spirit's saying do it. Caitlin's getting ready to go. I didn't tell you about this, Caitlin. Sorry, wherever you're at. I didn't ask your permission. I always try and ask their permission beforehand, but this time I, yeah, I don't have time. So Caitlin's getting ready to go into college. So I'm in my feels. I'm down. I'm emotional. Aspect on the inside. I'm a rock on the outside. But on the inside, I'm all torn up and all this stuff, right? Like, did I do a good job? So when you're at your worst, the enemy's going to try and come in. Two weeks ago, past, two or three weeks ago, Pastor Adam was preaching a message. And I was hearing bits and pieces of this message. And I told the Bible class this. I absolutely, I'm telling you, hated that message. I was like, you did a horrible job. Your theology's off. You're all wrong. You're messed up. But I heard bits and pieces of it. And the enemy's going to try and come inside of you when you hear bits and pieces of it to try and cause division, even on a level that's right there. And it took me, thank goodness the Holy Spirit was like, go listen to it again. Listen to it in totality. It was a great message. I mean, theology was right on. But that's what the enemy's going to try and do. And he's telling them, remind them. Remind them of this stuff. Remind them. He says, to be ready for every good deed. To slander no one. Not to be contentious. To be gentle. Showing every consideration for all people. That doesn't mean you can't correct. That doesn't mean you can't rebuke. But you do it with gentleness and love and forgiveness and everything else wrapped around it. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts, pleasures, spending our life in malice, envy, hateful, hating one another. But, but, when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared. It's by the kindness of the Lord that leads to repentance. And it's a kindness. He saved us 
This is that second gospel message. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we did in righteousness, but in accordance with his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he richly poured out upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And he says the statement is trustworthy concerning these things. I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good, beneficial for people. He goes on and he says, reject a, divis a divisive person after the first and second warning, knowing that such a person has deviated from what is right and sinning. Sometimes we go after and we go after and we go after and we go after. Sometimes you just got to give it to the Lord and let the Lord deal with it and let the Lord have it because it's by his kindness, it's by his kindness that we are saved. Amen. So as we close, would you rise to your feet? So as we close, I want to remind you that if you're in here today and you do not have a relationship with the Father, prayer team, if you want to come forward, you can come forward right now. If you do not have a relationship with the Father, if you're in here and you feel Him talking to you and speaking to you, let me remind you, you don't have to do anything other than just surrender to Him. You don't have to clean yourself up. You don't have to get yourself right. You don't have to do any of that stuff. So as every head's bowed, every eye closed, I want to encourage you today to surrender if that's on your heart. If you feel him pulling at you. I don't want it to be an emotional thing. I want it to be a true surrender. I give up. I give all control to you. When you hear those words, when the kindness of God our Savior, his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not on the basis of deeds. There's nothing you can do and you will never be able to do enough. Just surrender. If that's it, you in here, I would love for you to raise.